So this is to be a, uh, a discussion of basically what it's like to be both a polyglot and a professor. You have four individuals in front of you, and at the end of the day, that's all we can pretend to do be is uh, four individuals and present our own stories. But since we have the same job, uh, and we represent a uh, cross-section of, I guess, uh, modern academia. I myself, uh, I'm an American teaching at uh, international universities. Um, uh, Johan is a Belge teaching at a Belgian university. Rob is an American teaching at an American university. And uh, Tom here is the most interesting. Uh, he's half Polish, half German, teaching at a, uh, a Scottish university. So <laughs> we have... Um, a cross-section of different uh, areas of academia. Likewise, our fields of expertise. Uh, I got into my love of languages through comparative historical religion. So my main area of teaching is history. Um, Johann's main area is languages themselves, Turkic languages. Uh, Rob came from classical philology and teaches historical linguistics in general. And Tom, you're a neuro neuroscientist, yes, okay. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, have us, we sort of brainstormed a couple of topics and themes that we'd like to talk about, sort of give our experience and perspectives. Uh, and then uh, maybe after passing the mic around between us and maybe you know, if we have anything that we really want to discuss from that, um, then get feedback from you or other questions from you and uh, do that with maybe four or five themes and get as much uh, interaction as we can to see if maybe we can sort of summarize, uh, again, what is it like to be both a professor and a polyglot in the second decade of the 21st century? So uh, on that note, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, we had some interesting discussions or presentations in this room earlier today about comparative historical linguistics. And I think that there's no question that 100 years ago or even earlier in the 20th century, it would be um, a real expectation of any professor in that field or in many areas in the humanities that you should be, in essence, a polyglot, that you would need to know a large number of languages and so that doing so would be a real asset to your career. So um, that's something I'd like to talk about. Uh, in our lifetime, in our careers, um, well, in my personal experience, that really, I wish it were the case, but it hasn't been the case. Um, being a polyglot is not something that I've been able to really integrate all that well into my career. It's something I've sort of had to uh, keep something separate. It's not something I've been able to activate and use as much as I would like to have done so. And it's something that, in point of fact, I've kind of had to um, almost hide at times. So um, I think that's an interesting thing to talk about, particularly if the others have similar experiences. So let me pass the mic along down the line. Thank you. Um, as you told, um, I'm working at uh, Ghent University. Uh, I'm the head of uh, the Turkic uh, the, of the Turkish uh, section and um, the last years uh, I tried to orient uh, my research uh, into the direction of the languages which I have studied. Uh, when I was 13 years old I started uh, learning Turkish and then I wanted to learn that language uh, thoroughly so I had to learn Arabic and Persian and then I got interested in the Turkic languages of the Soviet Union, so I had to learn uh, Russian. Um, and uh, the number of languages always um, increased. Um, then in 1987, uh, a language contest was organized uh, in Brussels, the Babel contest, and I happened uh, to win that uh, thanks to uh, the languages I had learned uh, for uh, uh, Turkish. Uh, now I continue uh, learning languages um, and as I said I try to orient my research uh, to these languages. For instance uh, for my PhD uh, research on uh, motion verbs uh, I chose uh, Russian, uh, Turkish and Uzbek. Uh, for my uh, postdoc on intralingual translation from uh, Ottoman Turkish uh, to modern Turkish, a subject which I uh, proposed um, in, in that uh, project. I can valorize my knowledge of uh, Ottoman Turkish, of uh, modern Turkish, of Öztürkçe uh, purified uh, Turkish, of Arabic and uh, Persian. 
And two years ago, I started a, a cooperation with um, a professor on uh, Cappadocian Greek. Uh, it was thought uh, that it was an extinct uh, dialect spoken in Cappadocia uh, until 1923, but, but uh, that scholar uh, Mark Janssen has um, rediscovered speakers of that uh, dialect in the north of Greece. Uh, he doesn't know Turkish, but Cappadocian Greek has been uh, deeply influenced by Turkish. So we uh, cooperate and uh, I valorize my uh, knowledge of um, Turkish, uh, Greek, and even started to learn Armenian for that uh, project. Uh, so uh, knowing languages, uh, many languages can be an asset uh, in academia. Uh, certainly in linguistics, uh, if one knows languages, of different typologies, where I can give examples uh, from these ty typologies. Uh, as my answer is uh, certainly positive. Uh, it is an asset uh, to be a polyglot uh, in academia. Uh, it's an interesting thing, actually. In, in North American linguistics, um, I think we're moving increasingly towards a kind of monolingualism. Um, some of you might know that you know the uh, Chomskyan view of linguistics and syntax has been at the forefront for at least the past 50 years. And uh, much of that literature is actually done on English and the study of English and uh, this idea of there's the universal grammar and in your brain there's just at some level of abstraction all human languages are the same. There's the famous quote, um, if it's universal, show it to me in English. Which is, which is right up there with, um, in, if American were good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. Um, <laughs> but what I find strange is that um, it's come at the cost of, uh, like Alex was saying, that, that in the former days, linguists would be trained much, much, much better. Uh, you know, I came from classical philology, and uh, so it was very normal that it was just assumed you'd know Latin and ancient Greek like breathing. Uh, you needed uh, reading knowledge of French, German, and Italian was often considered optional by program, but in practical terms you needed the Italian too. And uh, so I, I, through my graduate career, I, I actually started on a PhD in Latin and, and mastered those languages for reading, and then you know you dabble in other things like Old English that are somehow related. But um, I think I've been lucky in my career because uh, you know the job market for academics has been somewhat poor in North America, I think at large, to say the least. And uh, at various times, I think at the worst of the uh, financial crisis in 2008, I was actually, I felt so proud I'd gotten a job. I was working as a, a German professor very briefly. And then since um, it was a very small parochial college in Buffalo, New York, and since no one knew anything about languages, the, the, the chair of the department, a woman named Ruth Kelly, came up to me and was like, Psst, you know Latin too, right? I'm like, yes, and <laughs> forsooth, I do, verily. <laughs> and so for a brief time, you know, I was a Latin professor, and I, you know, I think that that's a really interesting kind of thing because it should be that there's such specialization and there should be such focus that, that we're, we're living in a world where so many people get PhDs and specialize so early that you should have the creme de la creme de la creme in any particular field, and yet in languages, it seems like you know more than one. Well, knowing more than one was an asset. So as I said, you know, I worked br very briefly as a German professor, then as a Latin professor. I got involved in linguistics. Uh, and then, uh, much like Johan here, like for my dissertation, there were some 12 different languages that came into play, things like Gothic and um, Sanskrit, things that would be useful comparatively. And it's just in that span of breathing that, you know, if, if you're a linguist, that's what you do. You grab other languages and nothing should be a barrier to you. All those languages should be explorable. And it, it's really a hard time selling that idea to so many of your colleagues that they just, <laughs> they're like, how many languages do you know? And you're like, well, no is one thing. Have structural knowledge is another thing. But y you really just don't want to say yes. If you really want to have a conversation in Latin, we could make that happen. You know, it's just easier to sort of deal with. I'll stop there since I don't want to hog the mic too much. But it's, it's been a sort of conflicting time uh, in academia, uh, having sort of an awareness of languages and not seeing that as appreciated. Well, I think I might here be the odd one out because my background is not linguistics. My background is medicine. 
I did my PhD on aphasia, on language disorders in the brain, and then worked for decades as clinical neurologist with patients with dementia, stroke, different, different brain disorders, and then moving more and more into neuroscience and cognitive aging and so on. So you could ask, you know, what does it have to do with languages? Well, a lot. So if I think already of my time in aphasia, how many of you heard the name Broca's aphasia came across? Okay, so many of you, quite many, might have learned that, for instance, patients with Broca's aphasia produce uninflected forms, avoid grammatical endings, or produce bare stems. Well, this is because what most books write is Broca's aphasia in English speakers, maybe also in German speakers or Dutch speakers, but certainly not in speakers of inflected languages. So if you go and see Russian, Polish, Greek speaking, or Arabic and so on, uh, patients, the picture is completely different. They will not produce uninflected forms. They don't produce infinitives often. If your language doesn't have infinitive, then of course you cannot use it as a neutral form. So in a way, you can see that with then what is generally considered as a kind of universal is simply a completely biased way towards one, two languages. It was in fact, I mean, I would very much uh, agree with my colleagues, about 100 years ago it was much better. So if I think of one of my big neurological idols, Arnold Pick, who was a Moravian Jew working in the German University in Prague, of course fluent as these five or six languages, but if you look at his book on agrammatism, agrammatismus, he gives examples exactly, he noticed that, for instance, Romanian, I mean, Balkan languages don't have infinity, the patients will not use it, and so on and so on. So you have him having basically very good knowledge about five languages, but also structural knowledge about five or ten more, so that he can already predict that the clinical picture will be different depending on the language. This is not just about this, it's about uh, treatment. So for instance, in first treatments in Western languages, I mean Western European languages, usually start with noun and then move to verbs. In Russian, usually start with verbs because in fact noun is quite complex with the inflected forms. So in a way, it has to be something going throughout and a few years ago, with a student of mine, we were looking systematically at aphasia and found that practically almost all treatments are developed for English speakers and then simply translated for speakers of other languages. Complete rubbish. I mean, you are teaching things which are completely useless. You are not teaching things which are essential. And if you look at the influence on the models, all papers which have more than 50 citations describe patients who speak English. So then you have maybe the one or two descriptions of others which are seen as, a, uh, as an exception. Now, just one more example. Many of you will have heard about neuroimaging, fMRI, and so on and so on. Now, reading, also a very interesting topic. A few years ago, a study came out showing that, surprise, surprise, there is a different pattern of brain activation in Italians and in English when they read a text. Now, if you know something about English and Italian orthography, it's not surprising. Italian speakers will mainly activate phonology, English speakers semantics, because if you don't, and syntax, because if you don't know, for instance, if R-E-A-D is past or present tense, you don't know whether to read it read or read. Now, English tabloids were thrilled, said, now we have scientific proof that Italians don't think when they speak. <laughs> not exactly a correct interpretation of the data. But that shows how basically the incredible ignorance about language makes people not understand that there is not, I mean, brain is not per default a brain of a monolingual English speaker. It's per default a multilingual brain which is able to deal with a lot of different languages, and depending which language you have, you will have very, very different pictures. So in fact, there's a beautiful study a couple of, uh, I mean, decades ago, of a, a he Hebrew uh, English bilingual, had a different, had a more of a Wernicke type aphasia in Hebrew, but broke a type of aphasia in English. So I would say for neuroscience, language matters a lot, and that is exactly what I will be speaking tomorrow in more detail in my, in my talk on the cognitive effects of bilingualism.
So it seems like we're all agreed that uh, being a polyglot is or, or should be uh, an asset uh, to any kind of real investigation of anything having to do with, uh, with language, be it learning languages themselves or understanding how they get where they are or what the effect that they have upon our brains, but that somehow uh, in the climate of current academia, it is not as common as it used to be. And uh, as you've mentioned, Rob, it's just not uh, appreciated. It's, uh, it's actually somewhat uh, put down. I can think of some anecdotes from uh, my own time in, in graduate school when I told my advisor I wanted to be a polyglot, and he said, don't say that, that's a dirty word, nobody will take you seriously. Uh, and, you know, just the whole idea that somebody can or should know, uh, you know, at least in a scholarly fashion, a dozen languages is just seen as basically impossible and not serious. The idea should be that you only uh, learn one language. Uh, there were two uh, remarks that cro cropped to my mind. A few years back at a conference, I met someone doing uh, comparative literature, so studying literature of different cultures. And she was speaking quite eloquently, and I was, I was with her as much as possible. She was talking about themes in, let's say, Faust. It wasn't Faust, but we'll say Faust and the Iliad. Very unlikely pair, Greek and German. And she was talking and talking. She was so impassioned. She gave this great 45-minute talk. And after the talk, I sort of cornered her and said, well, wow, you read, you read the Iliad in ancient Greek. And she's like, oh, no, I read it in translation. And boy, does your sort of awareness and cherishment of, of that particular work plunge if you just aren't in the know. I mean, whether you're talking about the scansion and the sort of the, uh, the prosody of the language and you have that sort of awareness of the richness of Homer's prose, it's a sad thing to sort of have that spurious knowledge of language. Um, some of you were at my talk a moment ago, and one of the things I, I've been seeing more of in my uh, classes at Northeastern is that uh, students come in with virtually no preparation whatsoever, um, in the sense that they get something equivalent to language culture uh, for Spanish, maybe seventh, eighth, ninth grade, and then they often don't have to have a language before that. I've only been teaching at the college level for about 12 years, uh, uh, but you know the number of students coming up with any kind of Latin, any kind of Russian, any kind of French, any any kind of multilingualism at all, where you can sort of say to them at an intro linguistic class, so you know what languages can I use as my demonstration examples? What do you speak? What do you know? What prior knowledge do you bring? And increasingly, it's a tabula rasa. There's just there's no frame of reference. So what I would take as very simple examples with my own background in Latin. Latin being an entree to things like principal parts of verbs, Latin being an entree to things like conjugation and declension, which isn't actually all that hard, um, you know, if you're sort of of the mind to memorize all the forms. They just have no frame of reference of a case language, so then you can't do ergative absolutive languages, you can't do uh, highly inflectional languages like Russian. It just, it just, it really, you're, you're dealing with a much more monolingual population. I would like to add a comment about the seriousness of uh, polyglottery in um, academia. Uh, there is a relation uh, with uh, the media. Um, for instance, uh, when I won that uh, contest in 1887, uh, the bubble contest, then I got uh, an exposure, a high, very high exposure to, uh, to media. And I always uh, tried to uh, tell uh, to explain in a scientific way uh, how I studied these languages, what was my method, what was my aim, and so on. And uh, many times I noticed that this was extremely simplified in the media. The man knows uh, 32 uh, languages, uh, for instance. I never used the, the expression I know plus a number of languages. I always said uh, I studied so much languages until day of today I studied 42 languages but I don't know uh, 40, 42 languages the level uh, is different for e each uh, language uh, the competences are different uh, the topics um, over which I can about which I can talk uh, are, are different uh, but the media simplifies this uh, and that has a negative effect on the academic credibility um, because uh, in academia uh, it is thought that you have said that, that you have claimed to know uh, so, ma so many uh, languages. So one has to be extremely uh, careful uh, when giving interviews, um, even when par participating in certain uh, programs, uh, entertainment programs. 
uh, I got an invitation for a Dutch uh, program called My Secret. And in that <laughs> program, the um, person was uh, invited in uh, the studio. He had a secret and a panel of four Dutchmen uh, had to guess his secret. The person could only answer with yes or no. Uh, my secret would be that I had studied so many languages. And they told me, the person before you has a bullet in his head from the Second World War. But don't tell it anything, it remains a secret. So if you, uh, as a polyglot, uh, participate in such uh, uh, programs, uh, then that harms your academic uh, credibility. Um, Yeah, I mean, the interaction with media is a very, very complex topic. I mean, for, for many reasons, I think. Obviously, they want to make a nice story, and then I get also very often asked, you know, how many languages do you speak, and so on. I mean, what I try to do, I mean, this year, in fact, together with a colleague of mine from education, we wrote a paper about healthy linguistic diet. And the idea is that the kind of healthy mission that was thrilled, Rob, seeing in one of your last slides, something about healthy bilingualism. And the idea is that healthy linguistic diet, we compare it like to a healthy diet where you don't eat just salad or just this or that, little bit in things in different, uh, in different, so to say, doses, that, you know, you have a certain languages in which you feel quite confident communicating, some in which you have basic communication, and some where you have structural knowledge. So, for instance, my Chinese is absolutely awful, apart from being able to order some food in a restaurant, but it is enough for me to predict, for instance, which problems in English Chinese students will have, or what will be a classical pattern of aphasia, and so on, so on. So in a way, it's a kind of graded system of, let's say, relatively fluent knowledge of some languages, some more basic of others, and I say structural knowledge, which is still very, very useful and can help you understand, for instance, difficulties that you have, or certain things at the at the brain level, what will be the activation, and so on and so on. Seems like the two things we're talking about are uh, linked. The fact that, um, that this conference here, thanks to Alex and Richard, is like the one place that we can come together and everybody just understands that that question, how many language do you, languages do you know, is nuanced. And we have to say, well, what do you mean by a language? What do you mean by to know? And the fact that that is not understood among our colleagues in the fields of linguistics or humanities that have to do with the linguistics is um, frustrating, to say the least, or just uh, en enigmatic, very strange. And then that leads in a chicken or egg type situation to the, uh, the, the problems with the media, because every so often, for whatever reason, uh, people do get interested in professors or polyglots, or people who want to know things, and I've had the same thing. I have never claimed to know any number of languages. I've always denied it, and yet when I've tried to give uh, interviews to people who seemed like they were doing serious uh, research into language learning, it's inevitably come down he knows 50 languages, and I never said anything like that. So um, it is uh, frustrating that there is this sort of lack of serious scientific investigation, but I think that seems to be based on the, um, the lack of understanding throughout of what a, what a language is and why they're valuable to know. Well, coming, Rob, to your remark about Chomsky and approach, I think it might have also contributed to it, because in the Chomsky approach, you either know a language, you have, so to say, the native competence, or you don't. So in a way, it's a kind of zero-one system, which for me as a neuroscientist is so absurd that, you know, and the idea that somebody thought about it is already, should be a matter of a psychopathological investigation. <laughs> So if anybody for you looks for, you know, kind of social aspects of science, PhD, that would be a very interesting topic. I mean, for me, the kind of the Chomsky linguistics is a perfect linguistics for people who hate languages. <laughs> so if you happen to do linguistics, but you really hate languages, then that's the way to go. Again, panel discussion, we want to be a bit more interactive. We're uh, hogging the microphone. Are there any questions or comments from the audience about what we're talking about for anybody in particular? We'll let Rob answer because he had the mic last. Um, this is a question more directed towards the um, two American professors, but as a student, oh, can you guys hear me? Yep. 
All right, so as a student um, applying to both either like an American grad school or just like a later college, how do you recommend like doing an application that's based on languages instead of, because we can't just say, oh, I know fi five languages, you know? Like, how do you say, how do you use, do, use structure your application to represent your knowledge of the culture of the, um, of the language, of how you interacted? And like, how, how does one do that instead of just saying, I know these languages? It's actually a really strong question. In my uh, capacity as an advisor to students who are applying to graduate school all the time, I say you have to watch out because there are certain, in, uh, I have to be careful about not naming names, but there are certain colleges and programs that are so chomsky in that if you are a, a devout polyglot and you love languages, it will, it will squash your interest dead because you will be doing uh, movement and tree structures and you will do things that are so pseudo-cognitive that they bear little resemblance to anything that you know and cherish about languages. But it, it's hard to say that to students. You know, there's all sorts of X factors about money and, um, and interest and hometowns and things like this. So, uh, but you have to do your research. What I would do is go, whenever you want to apply to a graduate school in linguistics, what I would say is you go to the website uh, you don't look at all the bilk they give you about how many credit hours and how much program you have to do. Look at the researchers. Uh, the Canadian re universities are really good for this because very often the, the faculty will have their languages listed and usually such and such a professor will have been out doing field work in Cameroon or they'll have done field work in Papua New Guinea. Those are the programs that tend to pff, uh, privilege um, field work and descriptive linguistics over uh, more theoretical models, and and you do want to be careful with that. Any anytime, cognitive tends to be a code for Chomsky, and uh, psycholinguistic tends to be a code for Chomsky. And despite the reality of the situation, you want descriptive, you want field work, uh, you want people that have papers published on specific aspects of specific languages, such that like if you see someone, um, I'm thinking about a, a woman at Brandeis who actually speaks fluent Icelandic, you can see that half of her paper titles are in Icelandic. That's itself a good recommendation that this person actually knows what she's talking about, so. So now that I have four linguists in one place or neuroscientists, what's your opinion on Altaic? Oh, uh, the Altaic, the, the big yeah. family from Turkey all the way over to Korea? Yeah. For fear of causing controversy. I'm not sure there is much of a con can Do you want to field this one? It's a question for you here. Um, I would have to, to study Mongolian also to... Uh <laughs> 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 and I, uh, <laughs> then I can go beyond the Altai Mountains. Um, so there are many uh, convergences between uh, Mongolian and uh, the Turkic uh, languages. Uh, but uh, all languages uh, evolve in certain ways and um, the fact that there are resemblances between languages does not mean that they have influenced each other. Um, as, as far as I know, that uh, concept of the Altaic languages uh, is discutable. I lived in Korea for a long time, and I know that Korean linguists adhere to that very much. They want to believe that Korean is Altaic, but most Western linguists see it as an isolated language. But I also know, uh, yes, from, from anecdotal evidence from Korean colleagues who have learned Turkish and learned Quechua even, that, um, that you know, just because they're agglutinating languages, that does make them easier to learn, but they aren't necessarily Altaic. Okay, um, so I am a travel podcaster, so I'm kind of guilty of uh, this, you know, Richard Simcott speaks 50 languages. So um, what would you guys recommend? I, I would kind of like to go one by one, like in 10 words, what would be a catchy title for <laughs> you guys? That's also true, but it's not like, oh, this and this professor speaks, you know, Turkish or something like this, so, yeah. Well, uh, we, we broached on this theme before. One thing I would just really stress is the literature is very clear that you know, th there's no such thing as perfect bilingualism. The media often says, you know, oh, you're bilingual or you're trilingual. It, the default assumption is that, that you have 100% perfect active and passive competencies in all the languages in question. And that's not true. Obviously, there's a great deal of attrition. There's a great deal of strengthening when you go into these speech environments. Uh, one of the, I'm going over 10 words, sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know I, I, I sometimes say I speak German, but you know, uh, until today, I hadn't spoken German in about a year because you know, in the North American context, there wasn't anyone to speak with. So, you know, but in that conversation, it comes, it comes back to you. And so that would be my buzzword is that you know, tr 
avoid that view that there's this this perfect, you know, you speak 43 and each of those are absolutely perfect 100% competencies in the language. It's just completely false. Well, okay, so I, I have to do a title, you know, so okay. <laughs> if I have to title it, what would I title it? Alexander loves languages, studies hard, and got good at it. <laughs> And uh, I would say, uh, look at the context. Uh, what's the, the aim of learning a language? Uh, in uh, uh, February, I got an invitation from a Kazakh Turkish uh, university in uh, Kazakhstan uh, to uh, give two lectures uh, in Kazakh on uh, uh, language uh, didactics. And um, my Kazakh was tourism Kazakh from uh, 25 years ago. So I took the challenge and I listened every uh, evening to the Kazakh uh, television broadcast. Um, I read books on uh, didactics. Um, I read it loud uh, at, uh, at my home. Um, and uh, after the three months, uh, I could give my uh, presentation in Kazakh. Uh, I could answer the questions uh, from the audience uh, in Kazakh, uh, but that was a very uh, restricted topic. I could not talk about politics in, in Kazakh uh, or uh, sociology or, or another uh, topic. So one has to, to look at uh, the context. Uh, can a person function in that context, uh, in that specific uh, <coughs> language? Well, I mean, for the last couple of years, I've been giving shows at Edinburgh Fringe about languages. They have something called Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas. And the <laughs> idea is that academics kind of engage with the general audience. I love doing it. Most academics don't. But uh, so last, last year's title was, should National Health Service pay for language lessons? <laughs> Which I said, of course. <laughs> this year was, is monolingualism killing us? Of course, yes. And in this case, I would say, 10 words, the normal state of human brain and mind is multilingualism. Yeah. Uh, can I? I have a question to the American professor in the lovely jeans. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no, the blue jeans, the blue jeans, okay. Yes. Uh, you were saying earlier that your um, monolingual students, or mostly mon monolingual students, were lacking a reference structure. And wouldn't the obvious answer to that be, teach them the grammar of their own language? I had to learn German grammar for 10 years until it came out of my ears. Every year, over and over again, and every time a little bit more complicated. But it has served as a reference for all my language languages. I, I can tell you two quick answers to that. Um, <laughs> one is that uh, I've been dying to convince my academic chair to let me teach ancient Greek. And it shows you something of the climate of the times that as a professor of linguistics, where there's no other professor in the entire university of some 35,000 students teaching ancient Greek, they said, no, that has nothing to do with linguistics. And I said, you've probably never opened up a Greek book in your life because there's some 180 forms of the Greek verb in active forms and there's at least as many as passive forms. It's a highly rich inflected language. It has a stem alternation. Uh, in terms of just learning a different orthography, I mean, talk, you talk about structure. The ancient Greek would be just a boon for linguistic students. I, I, th I would say one of the reasons I'm, I'm quite good at linguistic morphology in, as an academic field is that I did have such a grounding in the classical languages and I, I always think about that. That's the first story. The second story is that I very briefly worked in an education department where I was um, in charge of instructing TESOL candidates, uh, future teachers of English as a second language. And that was the course I did. I did basic, uh, basic English. It was English for native speakers. Uh, you wouldn't believe the lack of knowledge of what an object of a preposition is, what a predicate is, a definite versus an indefinite article. The most basic things that I think we all take for granted, it's like, oh, you know, Latin, oh, okay, Greek has articles, Latin doesn't, okay, I can live with that. No frame of reference. So uh, trying to instruct linguistics and teach English grammar, uh, I, I wonder what elementary schools are doing. I just, I, I just don't understand why that knowledge isn't already being taught at some other level of the uh, curriculum. This Thanks question for the comment on the genes. 
<laughs> this question is for Professor Arguedes, who had earlier, uh, was it two years ago or so, you were talking about a movement for polyglottery uh, in academia. And what would be the potential for those of us in the room who are interested in being involved in such a movement to, to work with you and carry this movement? Uh, I don't, <laughs> I, I wish I could be, you know, just uh, here's sign up and it'll happen. But uh, I guess that would be kind of the first stage. I mean, the energy growth for that has to come out of uh, this kind of meeting of minds, this kind of meeting of energy, this kind of uh, convincing any kind of potential institute that it would be worthwhile having such a program. Uh, but as we can hear from, you know, what we said on the stage, uh, it, that might be, uh, a hard battle, but certainly there are some institutes, institutions that are more sympathetic to that than others, and so it's just a question of finding the sort of right host home and then convincing them that we have a, a body of people growing out of uh, you know a conference like this to say, yes, this is something that uh, is, is worthwhile. I mean, if we had people coming at it from a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary perspective, um, it's talking about the, uh, the cultural value of learning languages, the literary and cultural value of learning languages, the uh, historical linguistic value of learning languages, the mental cognitive value of learning languages, the value of particular language families, um, I think that would be a strong argument to, to some institutes. So hopefully we'll prevail at some point in the not too distant future. My uh, question is mainly for Professor uh, Fandavala, but if, uh, you know, if there are any professors who know anything about the, the topic, um, please feel free to jump in. Um, as a student myself of linguistic anthropology, so uh, of course I know the, the difference between uh, Chomskyan and, and Worfian philosophies on language quite well. Um, I also, besides the, the, the normal language and culture studies that linguistic anthropology brings, I've also studied psycholinguistics from a certain anthropological perspective, certainly not neuroscience. Um, but I wanted to um, ask, just to you know get, get your uh, thoughts on it, Professor. Um, what, you know, how much um, credibility does the actual idea of Broca's area and Wernicke's, aphasia, uh, Wernicke's uh, area and the, the two kinds of aphasia actually have? Um, because I've studied in my courses, at least a, a lot of professors have said that um, in, you know, in a sense, Broca's area and Wernicke's area aren't necessarily the only parts of the brain that, that certainly determine different functions of language. So, um, you know, their credibility isn't exactly like this is 100% this is all for language production, this is all for language understanding. Um, and then of course, well the first question is how much credibility do, does that have? And then uh, the second, how does that vary cross-culturally? So I regret to say that it's not my topic, but uh, I think it's Thomas' topic. Probably. Yeah, <clears throat> probably. Well, I mean, a couple of points, a very, very good question. So firstly, uh, there has been indeed, I mean, what we have learned about language is that language involves many more parts of the brain than just Broca and Wernicke's area. That's absolutely correct. It doesn't mean that Broca and Wernicke area are not important. It just means that the network is much bigger than ever thought before. And in a way, it's quite logical if we think how important language is. What is involved there? Perception, production, social cognition, emotional cognition, uh, social interaction, rules of grammar. I mean, it is basically half of the brain. And I think that makes, so to say, the effect of language so important. So from this point of view, you are absolutely right. They are two crucial areas, but in a much, much bigger network. Uh, second point is, and that has been already recognized probably by late 19th century, Broca's aphasia is not just an aphasia to Broca's area and very good aphasia to very It's slightly unfortunate we are using this, this term, so to say, as if it would be one-to-one -one relationship between anatomy and, uh, and uh, the symptomatology. I mean, this is not the case. But I would say, I mean, the main message for me would be they were incredibly clever, the 19th century writers. So if you think, you will still find the most modern uh, neuroimaging studies, you will still find these two areas being very, very important. And the connection between them, arcuate fasciculus, which only became practically studyable in the last maybe 10 years with diffusion tensor imaging. So I would say generally, I'm impressed how much they could describe with little knowledge they have, but we have learned more, and what we have learned is it's a much, much bigger network. So I have a question that follows up with um, a bit of neurology. So uh, by 
seeing people with brain damage, localized brain damage, you can see that it will affect a very specific function. Uh, it could be broad, but it can also be very specific. Um, like you say, with Broca's aphasia in specific languages, uh, lots of cases and stuff uh, get dropped. But in others, it's not. So there is localization, but depending on the language you speak, damage to that local area could have a different effect. Do you think that's because these localized areas are, can be multifunctional and they can learn to do any specific task? Or do you think the neural structure is set up in a particular way that it's particularly useful for a certain type of, uh, a certain aspect of language? A, l a lovely question. That's something I hope to go into more detail tomorrow. I mean, I would say there is a specialization, but it's not a kind of one-to-one. -one. I think one of the errors in kind of our metaphors of the brain is that we think almost like, you know, it's a chest of drawers and here you have, you know, socks and here you have, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's how still a lot of thinking goes. I would say it's much more like a company where you have people specializing in different things. So in a way, imagine that you have a specialist for, you know, Japan, specialist for China. Now the specialist for China is ill. The specialist for Japan can still do probably a better job than a specialist for Portugal, but not quite as the one, one who is for. So from this point of view, you do have specialization, but it's a gradual rather than absolute one. And that goes back again to what, you know, we spoke about, you know, uh, Chomsky and so on. In the brain, things are not kind of zero one. I mean, you have relative specialization, you have the ability to recover function, but maybe not exactly to the level before. And that explains the complexity of results. So once we go away from this kind of I would say naive black and white thinking this area has nothing to do with it and this area has everything to do with it. They are multi, I mean, they have different functions, they are absolutely right, and other, func other areas can take over some of the functions, but maybe not to the level that, you know, they kind of most specialist uh, area did. Hello, uh, my name is Judith. Uh, I have a different question, completely different topic now. Uh, I would like to get an answer from all of you, just a very sh uh, short one. Um, as you know, one of the most uh, contested topics in any group of polyglots is how best to start learning a language. Some really start with grammar, um, some start with a lot of reading, some start with a lot of uh, speaking, let's say the first three months only. Uh, do you I wonder if, considering you're all hyperpolyglots and you're all professors, if within a group of, uh, of yours there would be more of a convergence towards one particular method. Well, I would, I, I have a microphone, I can start. I would say there is obviously not one way. I mean, it's like you ask me, you know, I want to travel to a country. What's the best way to travel? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, whether you like to, you know, see the capital and uh, and the museums, or whether you like to go to the countryside, and so on, so on. So I think it's so different, depending on people's interests. That I think the idea of having just one way would be for me. I mean, let's see, look in medicine. We are speaking more about personalized medicine, that in a way it's not kind of one treatment that we give to everybody, you have to look which situation and so on and so on. If even in medicine we are going towards personalized medicine, I think we should go f definitely the same way in linguistics. I'm, I'm not asking for a recommend... Yes, uh, I'm not asking, I know exactly that if you want, if you have a different goal, then you're going to choose a different method. I was just wondering if when you are learning a new language, uh, you kind of use the same... Well, well I try approach. to look at some rules of grammar. I like, in fact, if I have a chance, and I'm not very pressed, to look at some text without knowing the rules, trying whether I can ex extract them. So coming to Iceland, I was kind of looking, oh yeah, the ur will be probably at the end, that will be the masculine ending, and it would be the, fe uh, the neutral, and so on, so on. So I like to kind of explore a little bit, and then try asking the locals to see whether it's correct. And with sentences, I mean, it's very interesting because it also, I mean, you mentioned, for instance, you would not discuss politics and so on in, in Kazakh. I find, in fact, discussing politics and science very easy compared to, let's say, going to a bar and discussing, you know, the local drinks, uh, which is much more slang and much more different vocabulary and so on. So I would almost say the more abstract the text is, the easier I find to read it. So if I have a text about history or about language and so on, I find it much easier than a conversation so to say from the street. 
Uh, it's hard to say any one method. I like his idea of exploration. Uh, usually I, I sort of stick in the family. I, I, I think it was mentioned that I was a historical linguist. So, you know, if uh, the other day I picked up a book of Danish, and I'm absolutely nowhere with Danish, so don't anyone try it. Um, <laughs> but the uh, interesting thing, though, is that you see commonalities. That You know, I, I look at I, I think about what I know about Old Icelandic, and then I compare modern Norwegian, and then I look sort of, say, at Swedish, and what little variables do they do, and then I say, okay, Danish, they drop every final consonant. And then, you know, I sort of, I, I do it sort of as a family relationship. Uh, I tend to be more rule-driven as an adult. I think even 10 years ago, I much preferred sort of the, the emergent dive right in approach. Um, so things have changed as I've gotten older, I think. When I learn a new language, I first uh, look for a textbook um, and I try to finish that book in a uh, very short time. For instance, uh, the Asimil books, uh, they have uh, one lesson a day as, as a system. I try to do seven lessons a day. So in ten days, uh, I have finished the book and from day one, I uh, start listening to broadcasts in, in the program, uh, in, in the language. Uh, at first, I don't understand anything. I remember f I was learning Albanian, and I only understood on the Voice of America, Uara, Uara, Uara. <laughs> and then uh, later it became uh, Bashkuara, which uh, means united. And then uh, a week later I, I heard, or some days later, Städte de Bashkuara de Americas, the uh, United States of America. So you don't have to give up if you don't understand anything. You have to listen uh, 60 hours, 100 hours uh, more. And uh, yeah, eventually, uh, you will start uh, detecting uh, the words. Um, I did the test for uh, Armenian when I started a year ago. Uh, I uh, noted uh, the number of words I un could understand in a news uh, broadcast. Uh, and every day, I. Uh, notice that the number uh, increased. Um, so that's a method that has an effect, but from the, what I found very important is, from the first day, uh, listen to broadcasts uh, in the language. Judith, very good question. I think it's interesting. We are seeing a commonality emerging, and I would just further that. Yes, the first thing I would do uh, would be, uh, like Thomas, would be to get get some text uh, or a li uh, something I could hear or something I could read and see what I could understand by myself, what I could figure out by myself. And then I would, yes, I would get an Asimil book and I would devour it. Uh, I would go through it as fast as I possibly could, not finish it, but just go through it and then go through it again and again and again. But to go through uh, an entire Asimil method uh, in, you know, in, in, in like a week or so gives you a huge overview and then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. Very, very short thing. Also, use all languages. With every language, you have additional information. Albanian, you mentioned. I was just a few weeks ago on the way to Albania, and I was kind of reading a little bit my Albanian book, and next to me were two people from Finland, but it's turned out from the Swedish minority. And then they said, oh, but Albanian is so difficult. I say, but look, you have very interesting common feature. The article is at the end of the word, like you have in Swedish. They, oh, we never thought about it. So in a way, they already had this knowledge, but they never thought of using a knowledge that they had from Swedish to apply to Albanian. So every language you know, try to apply this knowledge to anything new. Thank you very much, everyone.